So, coagulopathy in sepsis, that field is huge. You could have a whole day or a whole congress talking about it. So we will not have time to go into detail very much. And what, instead, what I have tried to do is to take a clinical management point of view. So there is increased risk of thrombosis in sepsis. There is increased risk of bleeding. How big are these risks? And can you or should you perform interventions with the aim of mitigating those risks? So that's the approach that I would like to take. I have no disclosures in doing so. I would like to briefly review the pathophysiologic coagulation cascade going on in hopes that you, you know, better appreciate the risk benefit of the interventions that we are going to discuss, okay? So coagulation starts off with a damaged endothelium. And what happens is that platelets get activated and they go to that site of the endothelium. Um, and they are greatly helped by uh, the production of envelopment factor from the endothelial cells, which promotes the aggregation of these platelets. But that is not a good clot. It's a very loose clot. So something else needs to happen, and that is the expression of tissue factor. And tissue factor activates the coagulation factors. And activated coagulation factors, in their turn, uh, produce thrombin. And thrombin um, ensures the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. And fibrin, that is what we need. Fibrin is the thread that helps the platelets to make a very firm and stable cloth. So that's the coagulation process. It's really quite simple. What happens in sepsis? A lot of changes. Oh, sorry, yeah. Of course, you cannot have abundant procoagulant response. You need to contain it with anticoagulant processes as well. And these are, we have endogenous circulating anticoagulant proteins, activated protein C, antithrombin, and tissue factor pathway inhibitor. And the other uh, anticoagulant process that is going on is fibrin fibrinolysis. So if you have this clot, the fibrinolysis will try to, to break it down. And in that way, the coagulation process is, is very well balanced normally. But in sepsis, a lot of changes go on. For instance, there's a huge increase in the excretion of envelopment factor, promoting aggregation of platelets. There is an increase in tissue factor expression, and thereby the activation of, of, of coag factors is greatly enhanced, and they get consumed, and the level of coagulation factors gets depleted. What is also depleted is the level of anticoagulant uh, proteins. So these you could say, oh, well, then there may be a bit of a balance uh, in, the, in this respect, but also the fibrino fibrinolysis is greatly shut down. There is a huge increase in fibrin deposits in, in the organs in sepsis. So the whole view is that the, it's quite a procoagulant profile going on during sepsis. So that reflects in the lab results of your patients, and I guess you can divide them in, in DIC, having DIC, which is really bad, and having it a little bit less bad, and they don't uh, come up to the parameters of the DIC criteria, but nonetheless the same. So consumption of platelets and consumption of coag factors will result in prolongation of PTA, PTT, and low platelet count, whereas D-dimer is, uh, is uh, elevated and antithrombin is also low. Some of you may use uh, viscoelastic testing in, uh, in appreciating the hemostatic capacity of your patients as it may reflect, you know, give a better reflection of, of that capacity. And if you do that in sepsis, you get very mixed results. It's either normal, it can be hypercoagulable, but it can also be hypocoagulable. But if you give a rough division in those with DIC, the overall view is that the, the viscoelastic test uh, reflect a hypercoagulable uh, 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 phenotype in that the, the, the time for clotting, the clotting time is prolonged, and also due to low platelet count, the, the firmness of the clot is, uh, is decreased, which shows up uh, as a low alpha angle and low MCF or MA in your viscoelastic testing. So if you find that in your patient, is that relevant? Well, yeah. Um, the worse the, the platelet count, the worse is the survival. The worse is the prolongation of the PT, the worse is the, is, is the, mortali is the mortality. And also DIC, you know, if your score is high enough, you in inadvertently die from, from sepsis. So there is a relation between coagulopathy and outcome in sepsis, very clear. 
but I'm not saying that the mechanism driving the mortality is related to the thrombosis or the bleeding risks. You know, thrombocytopenia may well be a proxy of something else, um, of and perhaps of an Im uh, a, a dysfunctional immune response. You can divide up your sepsis cohort uh, depending on their platelet count. And if you do that, you can see that the patients with a very low platelet count produce more IL-8 as uh, a marker of uh, an hyperinflammatory cytokine response. And also, if you compare your uh, sepsis patients who are thrombocytopenic versus those with a normal platelet count, and you look at the regulation of the genes, and blue is downregulated and red is upregulated, there are very large differences in the in the set of genes uh, that are either up or down regulated. So in thrombocytopenic sepsis, the complement sets in a, is upregulated, but uh, there's a whole bunch of genes that, that are down regulated and which relate to mounting an adequate host innate immune response and, and well, relating to functions such as uh, adhesion of, of, of neutrophils and, and extravasation of neutrophils. So thereby, Thrombocytopenia may just be a proxy of, of a dysregulated host immune response uh, in sepsis. But having said that, we still have this problem. Um, there is a risk of bleeding uh, and a risk of thrombosis in your coagulopathic uh, sepsis patient. And should you or should you not try to mitigate these risks? Um, first, let us see what is this risk of bleeding. We always seem to be a bit more afraid of bleeding than of thrombosis, is my feeling. Um, do we know this risk? Yes, we do from trials that have evaluated um, anticoagulant uh, interventions that have meticulously looked at the, uh, the incidence of bleeding. And yes, these the sepsis patients bleed 10 to 12 percent, but a major bleeding requiring red blood cell transfusion or requiring intervention, that actually doesn't happen that often. And an intracranial bleed is actually very rare. Okay, is the risk of bleeding increased if your coagulopathy is very bad? Yes, that's true, yeah. If you divide your population in, in, in very low platelet and not so low, you see that the, the risk of bleeding increases. But what this also tells you is that also patients with just a little bit of a low platelet count, you know, 100 to 150, I guess nobody will think about platelet transfusion in that category. Also, these patients have an increased bleeding risk, so there is just no really safe threshold that could guide your uh, therapy decisions there. What about procedures? We do a lot of procedures, always a bit worried about bleeding. There are a whole lot of observational studies out there, and we can summarize it with uh, the sentence that risk of following of bleeding following an, uh, procedures actually quite low. And whether or not you have a low plate account or an elevated your INR, it doesn't matter. It's just a low, uh, um, yeah, a low risk. Okay, let's talk about treatment with the aim of reducing the bleeding risk. Platelet transfusion. Are platelet transfusions efficacious in ICU patients? We have no data. There are no studies about the effect of platelet transfusion in ICU. What we know about platelet transfusion is from the hematology patient cohort. And this is the TOPS trial in which hematology patients have been randomized to receive a platelet, prophylactic platelet transfusion when their platelet count was 10 or lower versus a no prophylaxis uh, strategy. And in the no prophylaxis strategy, bleedings were, were, were worse. So actually that's where the guidelines tell you, okay, to, to transfuse your patients when a platelet count is 10 or lower comes from, from these trials. But actually, the majority of our patients, the, the platelet count is not that low. Usually, it's between 10 or 50, and it makes you wonder, well, should I correct that? Is th would that be, how is the ris risk benefit in that? And again, we don't have data uh, in ICU patients, but I would just like to, sh to, to draw your attention to the PATCH trial. Again, not in ICU patients, but this has been a trial in patients having an intracranial bleed while taking antiplatelet therapy. Um, and they were randomized to receive a platelet transfusion or no transfusion. So in my view, this is a very intuitive trial to give platelets to patients who are under platelet therapy and having a bleed um, with the aim of, you know, giving them fresh platelets which are not under the influence of the antiplatelet therapy. Um, these are the results, and you're looking here at a modified ranking uh, scale. 
and they were actually the opposite of what the hypothesis was. So the proportion of patients which were dead or neurological dependent was higher in those receiving platelets versus those re not receiving platelets. So that begs the question, what is the effect of platelet transfusion? What do platelets do? Um, well, a mechanism was not provided in, in this study, but you could think perhaps that you know, in, this, in, in a hyperinflammatory status, if you transfuse thromba, uh, the platelets, does that perhaps fuel an ongoing procoagulant process and resulting in microthrombi formation? Are there any data um, which can support that, that, that way of thinking? Well, no, not really. We just have in vitro data, and here are endothelial cells which were incubated with, with the uh, blood products, and you can see that platelet causes activation of those endothelial cells and production of cytokines, which was even worse if you have endothelial cells which are inflamed if you uh, stimulate them with LPS, so in an inflammatory status. Um, the addition of platelets even further enhanced the production of, uh, of IL-6. So that gives you a little bit of a direction that platelets may worse, worsen um, the endothelial activation. Um, so what about the efficacy of platelet prior to invasive procedures? Um, this is data from a very large cohort from the Mayo Clinics um, in which they looked at all the invasive procedures, uh, divided the patients into low pla platelet count or normal platelet count, and then looked at uh, those receiving platelets versus no pl platelets, and they looked at the bleeding or the need for red blood cell transfusion, um, and all in all, there was no effect of, um, well, of, of, the, of the platelet therapy. It didn't mitigate the risk of bleeding. So are there any other factors unrelated to platelet transfusion that can help protect against uh, thrombocytopenia? And these are uh, data from the PROTECT study, which is a very large study looking at the efficacy of, uh, of heparin uh, for as an anti-thrombosis prophylaxis. And there it was found that if you give low molecular weight heparin, you actually protect uh, against the development of, of thrombocytopenia. And the same goes for uh, the use of stress ulcer prophylaxis. So these are two measures which are quite easy, I think, and may protect against thrombocytopenia. So what about plasma? You may think my septic patient is in need of a little bit of volume and, well, the factor levels are depleted, so let's replenish them. We do two things in one and give them plasma. What does plasma do? Okay, these are uh, coagulopathic septic ICU patients, non-bleeding. You can see here that the factor levels indeed are decreased. Um, they're around 30, 40 percent. And if you give plasma, you increase those factor levels a little bit. It's, it's, it's significant, but it's just a little bit. But plasma, plasma is a soup of proteins. Everything is in there. There's also anticoagulant proteins in plasma. So if you infuse it, of course, also the level of the anticoagulant proteins go up, the antithrombin and protein C. So what is the net effect of that? Um, if you take thrombin generation as a quite a central process in the coagulation, you can see here, they, these are uh, four measures of thrombin generation. So th this is the time it takes for thrombin to start. Uh, it's the time to peak. This is the peak in the area under the curve. And you can see that um, in, in coagulopathic ICU patients, the ability to generate thrombin is decreased. So they have a coagulation problem. But if you give them plasma, it doesn't really help, okay? So, uh, interim conclusion related to risk of bleeding, I think the risk of a major bleed is quite low. Transfuse platelets when it's lower than 10, but uh, when the platelet count is not that low, I don't think uh, there is not much data, and I don't think there is a place for plasma or antifibrinolytic therapy. Okay, then risk of thrombosis. Um, how bad is that in sepsis? Well, uh, we know from autopsy studies that thrombotic events are frequently a missed diagnosis. And this is a study in which uh, septic patients were, were prospectively um, uh, well diagnosed for thrombosis with ultrasound. And you can see that one third of these patients has a thrombosis. And this is even under prophylactic heparin therapy. So I thought that was a very huge um, uh, incidence of thrombosis. Well, can we try to mitigate that risk? Are there treatments to reduce thrombosis risk? Oh, yeah, yeah, there are plenty of, 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 of things that you can think of in trying to stop off this process. 
most of what we've done until now um, have concentrated of replenishing a depletion of, the, st of the, the, the amount of the anticoagulant proteins. And of course, you all know about activated protein C. I don't want to talk about that. I do want to talk about two compounds um, which have, uh, are now under investigation. Um, the first is not a new intervention. It's antithrombin. Uh, but it has regained interest, uh, especially by the Japanese. Japanese are very active in their research on DIC, and they are well, quite strong believers in the, uh, in the effect of anticoagulant treatment in sepsis. Um, so all in all, at this point of time, 30 RCTs have been done, which have been summarized by this recent Cochrane review, um, stating uh, that as at this moment, in terms of efficacy, uh, there is not enough evidence to support the use of antithrombin in sepsis, whereas there seems to be a bit of an increase in the risk of bleeding. Having that said, the quality of evidence of all these trials is very low. So, in amount when 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 new data are coming, I, well, this this may change. The other compound I want to mention is thrombomodulin. Uh, what's that? That's a cofactor for thrombin and it converts the procoagulant um, profile into an anticoagulant profile, and it activates protein C. Uh, so that's thrombomodulin. And again, the uh, Japanese people have uh, a lot of interest in, in thrombomodulin, and in this single center study, um, as an interim measure of outcome, uh, it was shown that use of thrombomodulin in sepsis uh, reduced the, the DIC score, so it improved the coagulation severity in, uh, in sepsis. And this has been reproduced by a multicenter trial by other groups who have found roughly the same thing, a decrease in D-dimer as a, a measure of outcome of the coagulopathic, uh, coagulopathic processes in sepsis. So um, thrombomodulin is currently under study, uh, and uh, well, be on the lookout for results of that uh, compound. So how does this all mount up? There are several guidelines out there. Japan has written the guideline, the ISTC, ha ISTH has written the guideline, and other people. Um, all, all that's in the guidelines have been tried to be reconciled in this paper, which says, okay, if you have DIC or sepsis, coagulopathic sepsis, treat the underlying condition and the coagulopathy will resolve. Transfuse platelets when the count is below 10, but you can do it sooner when there is a risk of bleeding which I don't find very helpful because I think in DIC there is a risk of bleeding. Um, heparin prophylaxis is recommended even if your platelet count is very low. Sometimes there is discussion from can you give your, your, your prophylactic heparin, uh, is that safe to give when the platelet count is really low? I think yes, please give it because of the procoagulant risk that they're running of thrombosis. Um, give heparin when there is thrombosis and well in these guidelines um, it was formulated that you that you can consider giving antithrombin or thrombomodulin uh, in DIC sepsis. Some personal additions uh, from my point of view, I think that the risk of bleeding is quite low. I think that we should be therefore restrictive in transfusion therapy um, in the patients. Uh, the risk benefit when the count is between 10 or 50 in platelet count is unclear. We have currently a trial running of prophylactic platelet transfusion prior to invasive procedures uh, in patients with these counts. Uh, results will, will be available next year. Uh, prophylaxis are probably not effective and you may consider stress ulcer prophylaxis. So some of these issues have been uh, summarized in a special issue in which came out in transfusion medicine reviews if you want to read more about this. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much for that uh, extremely informative lecture. I know we're running a bit out of time, but I would like to ask you one question while Friedrich is looking up the uh, computer here. What's the, what's the latest on all versus red blood cell transfusion? Oh, um, that's <laughs> a bit off topic here. Yeah. Uh, the storage time of red blood cell transfusion, yeah. We've spent a lot of money and a lot of trials, um, and the overall is that there is um, in, in clinical relevant endpoints, 
in the clinical trials, uh, there is no effective storage time, which really contradicts a lot of, of studies in animals that, that have been done. And if you go into physiology, the same thing. But it doesn't come out in the large clinical trials. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that one here, uh, last one. Can Rotem or TEG help in the initiation and uh, dose of uh, DVT or PE prophylaxis in patients with sepsis? Um, I think that patients with sepsis should always receive DVT prophylaxis. Um, so I don't think that you need to do a Rotem for that. I, I, I can imagine that um, if you do a Rotem or, or a TEG, that you will find um, uh, hypercoagulability. But also those in, in, in another with another pattern, I think that they should receive uh, thrombosis prophylaxis. So, yeah. Okay, thank you so much for all the speakers. Thank you, the audience. And that concludes our session here.